Mercedes GLE is now a much stronger contender in the segment for premium badged large luxury SUVs. This second generation model gets smarter looks that clothe a bigger, classier cabin that in most models gives you seven seats. And buyers also get redesigned engines, a more sophisticated four wheel drive system and greater levels of safety and media connectivity. It all means that key rivals like BMW's X5 and Audi's Q7 must now take this car very seriously indeed. Think of all the reasons not to like a large luxury SUV 4x4. Thirst, poor performance, huge tax liabilities, wobbly handling, yet middle-class motorists still love them, patiently sure that one day the brands involved will bring us something better. Something perhaps like this, the second generation Mercedes GLE. We've only had the GLE name since 2015, but its bloodline dates all the way back to 1997, when what was then known as the M-Class beat two rivals to market that remain its closest competitors, BMW's X5 and Audi's Q7. In truth, the first W163 Series M-Class wasn't very good, it was poorly built and it lacked the brand's required premium feel, but Mercedes quickly improved it, launching a second generation W164 Series model in 2005. A further Mark III W166 Series version followed in 2012, a car then rebadged GLE in 2015 to fit in with a fresh Mercedes SUV naming convention that saw the GLE range pitched just above the brand's mid-sized GLC model. Like that car, the original GLE was offered in both standard SUV and coupe forms, as is this one, uh, and it's a standard SUV version that we're going to look at here. What that little history lesson rather glosses over is the fact that at the launch of this V167 Series Mark II GLE in early 2019, buyers shopping in this segment of the Mercedes SUV model line hadn't been offered a completely new design for nearly seven years. Now in that time, we've seen every other premium brand take a significant step forward in design and technology with cars of this kind. So big things were expected here. In this test, we're gonna see if that's been delivered and the prospects certainly look good. Sleeker design has been matched with a much sharper range of engines, new straight six diesel units and some mild hybrid petrols plus a plug-in version which can go over 60 miles on all-electric charge, and that's much further than its rivals. And of course, there's much more too. A fresh MHA modular high architecture platform with a longer wheelbase means a larger cabin that has standard room for seven on most models. Plus, there's more luxury and sophistication with the brand's latest twin widescreen cockpit displays and Hey Mercedes MBUX infotainment technology. Tarmac traction has been enhanced with an improved 4MATIC four-wheel drive system which more intuitively apportions torque between the axles and that aids off-road prowess too, should you ever need that. Plus, as I mentioned earlier, the US Tuscaloosa factory that builds all the brand's large SUVs can also deliver you a sleeker coupe version if you want that. Plenty to talk about then. Let's put this car to the test. In our experience, sport utility vehicle makers in the large luxury segment are apt to get hung up on one or other of those two words. So you get plenty of sport without a huge amount of utility, uh, as with Porsche's KN or BMW's X5, or utility without much of the sport, uh, Land Rover's Discovery or Volvo's XC90 perhaps. In between those two extremes lie cars of this kind that are neither one thing nor the other, examples being the Lexus RX and the Volkswagen Twilight. Now, it was in this rather grey area that the original Mercedes GLE used to sit. Uh, this one must do better. You'd hope it would. This second generation V167 series GLE design does, after all, have an all new MHA modular high architecture platform, expensively developed so it can be used uh, as well for the brand's pricier GLS and Mercedes Maybach SUV models. Now, that has brought significant improvements in chassis strength and it undergirds a completely fresh range of engines. 
all though must lug around about 2.2 tons of prime German real estate swaying 205 millimeters above the deck and that's quite an engineering challenge uh, in the six and eight cylinder Mercedes AMG GLE 53 and 63 formatic plus performance models uh, exemplary chassis dynamics do a decent job of keeping all that in check with the more softly sprung mainstream models though clever electronics are needed something perhaps like the active anti-roll bars that you can have fitted to a rival BMW X5 for example. Mercedes has developed uh, an even more sophisticated version of that kind of system, uh, e-active body control, but frustratingly because this setup is supposed to be very effective, uh, they've told us uh, that at the launch of this car it had no plans to offer it on mainstream GLE models here. So does that mean that potential KN and X5 buyers near not apply? Well, it would all depend on their priorities and which variant they had in mind. Few luxury SUV owners delight in throwing their cars around, a uh, much greater priority being the soft, cosseting ride that this GLE's aromatic air suspension serves up on the six-cylinder models, but not on the four-cylinder entry-level 300D diesel variant that we're trying here, which gets what Mercedes calls its agility control suspension package. Uh, that includes passive springs with adaptive damage camping. Now we've opted for this base 245 HP 2 litre engine because it'll probably be the choice of most GLE buyers but we were disappointed to find that doing so meant we were restricted not only to cruder damping but also to the older less reactive version of the Mercedes Formatic all-wheel drive system. Now this is carried over from the previous model which means it dates back to 2012 and it uses a fixed gear between the axles apportioning 50% of torque to either end of the car. A setup like that was acceptable on a cutting edge luxury SUV a decade ago, but it isn't now, which is why Mercedes has re engineered the formatic setup for all the more powerful variants in the GLA range. With this, the torque split can vary on demand, courtesy of a multiplate clutch system that normally sends 100% of power to the rear wheels, but when necessary, can send up to 40% to the fronts when required. Uh, the Stuttgart brand is presumably gambling that uh, GLE 300D buyers. Uh, either won't know or won't care about the lack of this technology. That is something of a risky strategy in our view given that this entry-level four-cylinder version is priced so relatively closely to a rival six-cylinder BMW xDrive 30D model with more power, full air suspension and a properly modern all-wheel drive setup. The GLE that most directly competes against that volume X5 model is the 350D formatic six-cylinder variant that we think probably represents the sweet spot in the range. It gets a 272 horsepower version of the brand's three-liter inline diesel, a unit we first saw on the S-Class, and one that's more willing and tractable than its V6 predecessor, developing 600 newton meters of torque, and that's enough to thrust you from rest to 62 in 6.9 seconds on the way to 143 miles an hour. Hour. The same engine also comes in a more potent 330 horsepower state of tune in the alternative 400D model, which has 700 newton meters of pulling power and performance stats that improve to 5.8 seconds and 149 miles an hour. Now we should talk about the three litre six cylinder petrol engine too because uh, Mercedes has spent quite a lot of time improving that. It's offered here in two flavours with 367 HP in the GLE 450 or with 435 horsepower in the Mercedes AMG GLE 53 performance model. In both cases the unit benefits from the inclusion of mild hybrid tech that sees a 48 volt electrical system supplementing the usual 12 volt arrangement. Now this powers a setup that's based around an integrated ISG starter generator which combines starter motor and generator into one powerful electric motor housed between the engine and the transmission. As well as a range of efficiency benefits, this provides as much as 22 horsepower of extra grunt under hard acceleration with extra pulling power low down right where you need it, helping to negate uh, turbo lag below 2000 RPM. The result is sparkling acceleration that sees the 62 mph benchmark dispatched in just 5.7 seconds in the 450 or in just 5.3 seconds in the AMG 53 with both models limited artificially to 155 miles an hour flat out. 
Uh, the 53 variant also gets an active curve function as part of its AMG active ride control suspension. You can even ask your dealer about an even faster V8 powered uh, Mercedes AMG GLE 63 if you want to go faster still, but we really can't see why you'd want to in this kind of car. Now that's not quite it for available engine options with this car, the final one being a package that we'd highly recommend, the GLE 350DE 4MATIC plug-in. A little unusually, this is a diesel-based PHEV uh, using a 194HP version of this 300D model's 2-litre unit. Uh, the electrified element is taken care of by a 100 kilowatt electric motor, able to take the car to a battery-powered top speed of 100 miles an hour. Uh, that rises to 130 miles an hour when the engine joins in, at which point 62 miles an hour from rest is achievable in just 6.8 seconds. Of course, pushing on like that isn't going to help this PHEV model's potential all-electric driving range. That's rated up at 61.5 miles thanks to the use of a lithium-ion battery that's one of the biggest we've ever seen in a plug-in model, 31.2 kilowatt hours in capacity. Uh, the transmission here is the same 9-speed, 9G Tronic automatic gearbox that's used across the rest of the range, which in this GLE works just as seamlessly as it does in the many other Mercedes models in which we've tried it. Change times of that paddle shift auto box are one of the things that's influenced by the standard dynamic select driving mode system, uh, the others being throttle response, steering feedback and suspension feel. And now this setup, which is accessible via this rocker switch down here on the centre console, doesn't unfortunately provide an auto or adaptive style mode to make all the drive setup decisions for you. But as usual, there is an individual setting which allows you to program in your own parameters. Most owners though will be perfectly happy with the preset eco, comfort and sport options with the full fat AMG models adding in sport plus and slippery modes too. The GLE also gets an extra dedicated off-road setting. Uh, yes, off-road capability. Well, we should mention that because unlike some of its competitors, this car certainly has some. If your GLE has aromatic air suspension, then selecting that off-road mode will automatically raise it to take you clear of obstacles that the standard 205mm ride height might otherwise see you crashing into. In the very unlikely event that you want a GLE capable of Serengeti-like heroics off the beaten track, uh, then you'll be directed towards an optional off-road pack which can only be fitted to the variant in the range that you might think would be least suited to off-piece driving, this four-cylinder 300D version. The lack of air suspension and the absence of the more advanced multi-plate clutch formatic setup certainly won't help this base diesel derivative off the beaten track, but much is provided by the off-road pack in compensation. Now the pack can't do much about the passive suspension springs, but it can at least provide the uh, missing variable traction capability. Now that comes courtesy of extra torque on demand technology, both for the traction and the dynamic control systems and for the clutch which offers interaxle locking that's able to alter distribution of drive torque from 0 to 100% between the axles. The off-road pack also includes a feature that's normally quite unknown in luxury SUV circles for any product without a Land Rover badge, a low-range gearbox. Plus, it also gives you hill descent control, um, Mercedes calls this downhill speed regulation, uh, specific mud plugging settings for the ABS, the stability and traction control systems, and for a really difficult terrain, an extra selectable off-road plus setting in the dynamic select driving mode system. A typical GLE buyer, of course, is unlikely to have the slightest interest in any of that. More relevant for a typical owner here would be the optional towing package that's only available on the six-cylinder models, which increases the standard 2,700 kilo brake towing capacity figure to 3,500 kilos, and as well as throwing in an electronically folding tow bar, includes the brand's clever trailer maneuvering assist technology. At up to three miles an hour, this can control your steering angle while you're reversing backwards and hitched up uh, as you monitor progress via dynamic guidelines shown as part of an additional part of the rear view camera display. 
That's the feature copied from Land Rover and Volkswagen SUVs in this sector. Cars like this one uh, don't really set out to rival the ultimate handling of segment contenders like Porsche's Cayenne and BMW's X5 at speed over a really twisty tarmac. The GLE's cause in this regard isn't helped by the somewhat vague responses you get from the electrical steering rack, even when it's weighted up a little in the Dynamic Select Sport mode. Uh, that setting also lowers the ride height by 15 millimeters at speed, and that's a measure intended not only to reduce body roll, but also to further improve aerodynamics, and those are boasted by Mercedes to be class leading. Now, doubtlessly, that contributes to this car's impressive levels of cruising refinement. Uh, you'll never need to raise your voice to chat to your passengers. As with all large luxury SUVs, the highway is where this one is in its element, especially if it's been fitted with the optional Active Distance Assist Distronic feature, which draws from the GPS live traffic data, um, which enables it to recognize and respond to a tailback and slow moving traffic before you even reach it. You get this as part of an optional driving assistance package, which amongst other things also includes Active Steering Assist, which basically will do most of the steering for you at a cruise, plus there's route-based speed adjustment which, uh, once you've programmed in a navigation destination, can automatically adapt your speed to the curves, the roundabouts and the junctions that you'll encounter throughout your journey. It's all very reassuring. Here's yet another car which claims to have invented the premium SUV segment. Well, the premium lifestyle SUV segment anyway. As we keep reminding these brands, Range Rovers have been around since the early 70s. There certainly weren't many posh badges prepared to invest in the crossover class when this model's M-Class predecessor first appeared back in 1997. The bloodline that then led on through two model generations and the name change to culminate in this V167 Series GLE is referenced most notably by this slanting C-pillar uh, with development throughout characterized by continual increases in size that now see this Mercedes model measuring as the tallest car in its segment. It's certainly a substantial piece of Teutonic real estate that has to now accommodate three rows of seats across more of its model lineup, hence a 105 millimeter increase in length over the original GLE. The 4.92 meter total figure is now well clear of a BMW X5 and it makes this car almost as long as Audi's huge Q7. But then you expect a contender of this kind to make a big pavement statement. Uh, the front end certainly now does. The twin power domed bonnet flowing down into this upright radiator grille. Uh, Mercedes' insistence that models in our market should have sporty AMG line trim means that this appendage is of the single louvre diamond style variety embellished by these glistening chrome pins. Another AMG line touch comes in the way that these lower corner air intakes are enhanced by twin chromed ribbing strakes, uh, adding further to all the silver work already in place thanks to this prominent chrome plated underguard. Just in case that's not enough to make fast lane dawdlers scuttle out of your way, there's a set of piercing ultra range multi-beam LED headlamps that produce a forward beam of over 650 meters. That's the maximum light intensity permitted by law. Uh, the profile is, of course, more purposeful than was the case with the original GLE. That car was, after all, merely a facelift of an M-Class model dating back to 2012. Here we have a clean sheet design that not only has the more substantial proportions we referred to earlier, but which also features smarter flanks dispensing with the previous mid-level crease line that used to flow beneath the door handles. That allowed the design team to create a far more flowing silhouette for the alternative coupe version of this design but here as you can see uh, our focus is on the standard SUV model which gets these larger 20 inch wheels sitting in prominent arches with larger 22 inches available on request and some nice little design touches uh, this slim air curtain slit behind the bumper for example that channels air across the front wheels and the neat pillared supports for the roof rails, the central one a visual extension of that distinctive angled C-pillar we referenced earlier. 
At the rear, the previous model's boxy conformity is replaced by a more sophisticated look, and that's aided by slimmer, lower set LED lamps with illuminated blocks featuring backlit edging. Uh, the neat roof spoiler references the class leadingly slippery 0.29 CD drag coefficient, while another chrome plated underguard impractically finishes things off further down. Of course, as usual, what's more important is the stuff that you can't see, namely this generation model's MHA, modular high architecture platform, which now incorporates a much higher mix of aluminium. Hence, a 33% improvement in rigidity this time around, and a curb weight that impressively is no heavier than the shorter, lower previous generation model. You are still looking at around 2.2 tonnes of curb weight, though. Okay, so the outside is now properly modern. Can the same be said inside? Well, the more upright A-pillar of this V167 series design makes it easier to get in. And once you climb into place, there's little doubt that a significant step forward has been made here. In place of the rather haphazard cabin design, which characterized the previous GLE, were instead served up uh, an interior that, in our view, sets a fresh benchmark for quality and sophistication. Now, some features are, of course, familiar from other large Mercedes models, primarily this distinctive widescreen cockpit layout with its twin 12.3-inch virtual displays. And, of course, there there's an exemplary standard of fit, finish and materials quality with a very high-end blend of leather, open pore wood and aluminium accents. Other elements though are unique to this GLE, perhaps most notably this prominent raised console between the seats which incorporates these arched grab handles either side of the palm rest here and the fact that the central vents which are usually round in other Mercedes models are squarical here. Uh, this quartet of them flanked uh, above a mid-level ambient lighting strip which adds unique nighttime illumination to the double stitch dash. As you'd want to in a car of this kind you sit high and commandingly and the leather stitch seats are smart and supportive with four-way electric adjustability and lumbar support. Uh, now you'll need to get comfortable because there is an awful lot to get to grips with as part of this enormous combined screen area that's 45 centimeters by 15 centimeters. Now this is your portal for viewing what is intended to be one of this car's technological highlights. It's new MBUX, that's the Mercedes-Benz user experience multimedia system. It's supposed to take in-car connectivity to a new level, and that is a boast that's slightly undermined by the setup's failure to include standard Apple CarPlay and Android Auto smartphone mirroring. That costs extra. Still, you do get Bluetooth, a DAB tuner, and hard disk SatNav 2. That's as part of a package that can be optionally upgraded to advanced navigation status with what Mercedes calls augmented reality technology. Now this is effectively a live camera feed of the road ahead overlaid with house numbers, road names, uh, direction arrows and other useful bits of information which will all help you find your way. The Stuttgart maker has tried to simplify access to all this media connectivity by making many more of the functions accessible without manual operation. There's gesture functionality, for example, via which, uh, once perfected, you can do things like program the sat-nav and alter seat settings. You're more likely, though, to regularly use this car's provided Hey Mercedes voice-activated functionality. Uh, the brand name designates the greeting that you'll need to address the screen in order to get the uh, incorporated MBUX speech recognition setup working. Now, as we've already remarked when we were testing some of the company's other more recent models, this aspect of MBUX remains, in our view, something of a work in progress. Sometimes, uh, you'll think it's absolutely brilliant when you're finding uh, radio stations, for example, or when it's telling you what the weather is at a program destination. At other times, though, if it responds at all, it either trips up over similar words, new and nude, for example, or it uh, chimes in when you don't want it to, say, when you're just mentioning the word Mercedes in casual conversation. 
So you'll still need to get very familiar with all the various manual touch pads that control the various infotainment elements. The main one being down here at the base of the center stack. Uh, now we don't especially like touch pad controllers. On the move, they're difficult to accurately use on anything but smooth surfaces. But this particular one is the best of its kind with easy functionality that's helped by these uh, surrounding shortcut buttons for navigation, radio, phone and vehicle features. Now, a note to Lexans here, if you want to give customers touchpad controllers, this is how you do it. Now, it deals with the various menus of the high resolution media display just above it, uh, divided into radio, nav, phone, media, comfort, and info segments, plus one for the various apps that you'll be able to access, most notably the useful Mercedes Me setup. Uh, there are some really sophisticated graphics in play here, especially when it comes to the real time displays that you'll find in the vehicle section. The same functionality can be accessed via another tinier touchpad on the left-hand spoke of the new uh, smart sports steering wheel. And if you use that to access the provided center screen settings menu, then you'll be able to customize the separate digital instrument monitor ahead of you via various design layouts. Uh, choose from normal blue tinged classic, yellow themed sport, an orange progressive dial display and a darker minimalistic understated setup. Now, once you've decided what you want, you can then use the other provided tiny touchpad on the right-hand steering wheel spoke to bring what you'd most like to see into regular view. And that's possible because the two virtual dials are both customizable. The left-hand one shows either trip computer info, a trip itinerary, uh, audio info, or driving angles and compass settings, while the right-hand dial can show GPS mapping, a G-force readout, safety assistance information, uh, suspension settings, and a proactive eco display. Now, finally, you can also tailor the area between the dials, the center part of the instrument binnacle screen, where you have a choice of viewing driving assistance, phone, navigation, uh, trip computer, radio, or media information. What else? Uh, well, the ergonomics aren't quite perfect. Uh, you'll initially be hunting for the starter button. It's curiously positioned down here by your left knee. And despite the lofty seating position, all round visibility could be a fraction better too. Uh, some might find these relatively chunky uh, front A pillars slightly obscure their vision at junctions and the relatively narrow back window and the angular rear styling that'll see you making frequent use of the standard parking camera and the all round parking sensors. Uh, the sensor info can be projected into your line of sight on this optional head up display and that's expanded in screen size to show far more than these kinds of setups usually do. Uh, another optional feature that we really like is the energizing package and that combines music, lighting and scent into a couple of selectable programs, Refresh and Vitality. And they're aimed at uh, rejuvenating you at the end of a tiresome day. Now there's also a training option which is aimed at relieving muscle strain on longer trips and an intelligent energizing coach feature which recommends individual programs based on the kind of journey you're on. Now it can even communicate with a smartwatch or a fitness tracker should you be wearing one and then it can automatically select a perfectly suited energizing theme that you can start directly just when you need it. As for cabin storage, well, there's pretty much everything you'd want. Uh, the smart slatted cover of this stowage area at the bottom of the center stack uh, slides back to reveal twin cup holders, a couple of USB-C ports, and an optional wireless charging mat. Further back between the seats, this twin lidded bin uh, incorporates a further USB-C port together with the converter leads that you'll need for it. Uh, there are bottle holders in the deep door bins. Uh, the driver's one incorporates uh, switches for the electric tailgate and for the optional power deployable tow bar and you get what would uh, usually be a spacious glove box and that's complete with a pen clip although here that has been compromised in size by the need to uh, incorporate the fragrance dispenser for the optional air balance package. Uh, what else? Now you also get a storage net in the front passenger footwell. You get ticket clips on the sun visors and you get an overhead glasses compartment for your sunnies uh, and that's around this uh, dual like lighting panel near the rear view mirror. 
time to take a look in the rear. An 80 millimeter increase in wheelbase suggests that things might have improved this time around for back seat folk. And sure enough, this is a part of the car where you most readily appreciate this larger body shell's extra space. There's 69 millimeters more legroom and 33 millimeters more headroom than there was in the previous GLE. Enough, in fact, so that six footers can easily be accommodated, even if, as here, the huge panoramic glass roof has been fitted. Plus, this time around, you not only get a backrest which can be adjusted uh, for rake, but a seat base that can slide over a range of 100 millimeters for extra knee space. Provided you're in a seven seat GLE, you'll find this rear bench to be electrically adjustable in four directions that you control via this switch panel here on the intricately stitched door panel. If there's ever a need to take three adult folk back here, the middle seated person's cause will be helped by the relatively low centre transmission tunnel, above which is a pull-out compartment with twin USB-C ports sitting below the controls and the twin provided vents for the standard four-zone climate system. A uh, B-pillar vents feature for that too. Plus you get decently sized door bins, seat back pockets, uh, coat hooks by the overhead LED reading lights uh, and a central armrest here with a storage compartment and twin pop out cup holders. Now let's look at the third row, the provision of which will be a new concept for most regular buyers of this Mercedes model line. Now some previous M-Class and GLE models did offer a tiny third row of seats as an option, but that feature was rarely taken up, even when the importers for our market deigned to offer it. In contrast, this V167 series GLE, uh, presumably in a bid to more directly appeal to Audi Q7 and Volvo XC90 buyers, gets seven seats as standard on all models except the base GLE 300D variant we've got here, which can have them an extra cost. That's an option that's been taken up here. Now to get in, uh, you click this button on the seat shoulder to activate the powered easy entry function, which then operates with arthritic slowness. And that'll be frustrating if you're standing out here waiting in the rain. Uh, once the aperture to the very rear is finally revealed, taller adults will do jolly well to access it without bashing their heads on that angled C pillar. Once you're in these rearmost pews, it'll be abundantly clear that a 4,930 millimeter vehicle length isn't sufficient for proper adult standards of legroom at the very back of a seven seat SUV, or it isn't in this one anyway. Uh, even if you can persuade those ahead of you to move their center bench base forward and compromise their legroom quite a lot, it'll be very difficult for any occupants above school age to feel in any way comfortable back here. Mercedes points out that these pews are primarily intended for children, to which we'd respond by asking why, if that is the case, Isofix child seat fastenings haven't been fitted. We only get those in the middle row. It isn't just the lack of legroom that's the issue either. Uh, the backrests of these third row seats are uncomfortably upright and they can't be adjusted. To be fair, seven seat versions of rivals like BMW X5 or the Range Rover Sport aren't much better in this regard, but you will be significantly better off in the very back of those XC90 or Q7 models we just mentioned. Kids who don't mind about these issues will be served by twin cup holders and a couple of USB-C ports, plus there's part use of a netted area on the left. Finally, let's check out the boot, and that's accessed via this uh, Easy Pack powered tailgate. Now, obviously, there won't be much space at all with this third seating row upright. You get a few shopping bags in, but that's about it. Uh, plus, there is a little extra room beneath the floor. In most cases, though, you'll be wanting to use your GLE with these extra chairs folded flush into the floor. Now, on the larger GLS model, that's a powered operation. Here, it has to be done manually, which can be annoying if the middle bench is all the way back because the chairs won't fold fully flat until that's pushed forward a bit. With the boot area properly freed up, you'd hope that the extended rear overhangs of this second generation GLE would have improved luggage capacity. Actually, with the middle row bench slid back in its most usual position, the 630 litre capacity figure is actually a significant 60 litres less than what was served up by the previous generation design. But of course, in this case, there's the flexibility of being able to slide that middle bench forward for extra luggage space when necessary. And if you were to push it as 
far frontwards as it would go here, then you'd have a total of 825 litres to play with. Uh, aside from the impractical chrome trimming to the top of the bumper and the loading lip, which will quickly scratch if you're loading in heavy, bulky items, this is a pretty usable space. Uh, you will fit in slightly more luggage than you'll be able to do in a rival BMW X5, eight carry-on suitcases below the parcel shelf, but in a similar configuration, a Land Rover Discovery could take nine cases and an Audi Q7 could swallow 10. Uh, if you do happen to be lugging in weighty stuff and you have a GLE fitted with Airmatic S suspension, then there's the convenience of this right-hand cargo sidewall button. That lowers the rear by up to 40 mils for easier loading and unloading. Uh, four tie-down points and a couple of bag hooks are of course provided, plus there's a netted area here to the left. There's no larger space beneath the boot floor, hence no spare wheel provision, and that's annoying on such a potentially capable SUV. A 72mm increase in through loading width comes courtesy of the 40-20-40 split of the second row bench, which means that longer items like skis can be pushed through into the passenger compartment without disturbing a couple of rear seated folk. If you need extra cargo room, then more buttons are provided on the cargo sidewall to electrically retract uh, both sides of the second row backrest. This folds flat into the floor, but it does leave a slim middle gap between the folded rows into which smaller items might fall. In this configuration, up to 2,055 litres of luggage space is available, or 1,915 litres if you have the GLE 350DE plug-in model. Either way, that'll be quite sufficient for most likely buyers. GLE models sit mainly in the 55 to 65,000 pound bracket, although inevitably you'll need to find significantly more than that for the Mercedes AMG 55 and 63 performance variants. In this film, we're primarily considering this standard body style, which from launch was only offered with this relatively sporty AMG line trim level. If a sportier looks your thing, then you'll want to know that Mercedes is also offering a sportier coupe version of this SUV. For one of those, expect to have to find a model for Model premium in the region of around £5,000 over this more practically shaped version. The vast majority of buyers will of course be looking at a diesel variant. We've got the base GLE 300D formatic model here, which gives you a four-cylinder, two-litre, 245 HP unit and a five-seat layout for around £55,000 or a seven-seat cabin for a couple of thousand more. All the other mainstream models come only with seven seats. Uh, we think that most potential buyers are going to want to find at least £62,000 to get themselves one of the six-cylinder diesel variants. Uh, now they come with the Airmatic air suspension system and the more sophisticated multi-disc clutch uh, formatic four-wheel drive system that you can't have on the base 300D. With a six-cylinder diesel GLE, there's a choice of either the 350D formatic version with 272 horsepower or for £2,275 more, the 400D formatic derivative with 330 HP. We suggest that both the three-litre variants represent the sweet spot in the range, but there is also a case for making a similar spend on the lineup's single plug-in version, the 350DE formatic, which uses a 194 horsepower version of the four-cylinder diesel unit mated to a 100 kilowatt electric motor powered by a 31.2 kilowatt hour lithium-ion battery. In the unlikely event that you want a petrol engine in this car, then your dealer will point you towards the GLE 454 Matic, which was priced from launch at just over £62,000 and which is enhanced this time around by Mercedes's EQBoost mild hybrid technology. Now this extra electrification adds 22 horsepower to this six-cylinder, three-litre petrol GLE's standard 367 horsepower output. There's also a Mercedes-AMG GLE 53 formatic plus performance version which uses the same engine in an uprated 435 hp state of tune and if you want more the usual a falter back tuned twin turbo four liter petrol v8 features in the top mercedes amg gle 63 formatic plus model and it offers well over 600 horsepower which you'll be pleased to hear if you're one of those who take the view that you can never have too many tiger tokens 
Right, let's move on to the mainstream rivals that potential GLE buyers will be considering in the premium large SUV segment, with our competitor price focus being against the diesel versions of this Mercedes that most customers will want. Now, the Stuttgart brand's increased emphasis on the seven-seat format this time around uh, means that a GLE will now be of much more interest to someone who previously in this sector uh, would automatically have plumped for either a Land Rover Discovery, a Volvo X XC90 or an Audi Q7. At first glance, all three of these contenders seem to offer significant savings over a GLE, but that's only if you're prepared to consider the kind of lower spec trim level that Mercedes doesn't bother with here. An R design spec XC90 or an S line spec Q7 would cost much the same as an equivalent AMG line trimmed GLE, and a comparably powerful version of an SE spec Discovery would get within a couple of thousand of this Mercedes too. The most natural competitor for this car, though, remains BMW's X5. Now, that car can't be had with a four-cylinder diesel engine anymore, but BMW has pitched the most affordable version of its six-cylinder X5 xDrive 30D at only a couple of thousand pounds more than this four-cylinder GLE 300D formatic model. That particular X5 really competes more directly with a six-cylinder GLE 350D formatic. Uh, for reference, we'll tell you that that Mercedes will cost around 3,000 500 pounds more than its BMW equivalent once you've factored in the extra cost of seven seats into an X5. Other segment rivals aren't as directly comparable, but for completeness, let's uh, cover them off for you. A Volkswagen Touareg, which will save you around £5,000 in base diesel form, doesn't quite have the class of this Mercedes, and it can't be ordered with three seating rows. A Lexus RX, which can now be ordered in seven-seat form and would save you uh, two to £3,000, is only offered with a self-charging petrol hybrid engine, which you may not want. Uh, more powerful versions of the Range Rover Velar or the Jaguar F-Pace, well, they might conceivably attract your attention if you only wanted five seats, but uh, those are slightly smaller cars. A top Toyota Land Cruiser, well, uh, that is comparably priced to this Mercedes, and it certainly has the seating rows and the cabin space to interest a potential GLE customer, but it's much clunkier to drive and it's far pricier to run. What else? Well, you'd pay similar money to what Mercedes is asking here if you were to choose either of two sharper handling contenders, the Maserati Levante or the Porsche Cayenne, but both only come with five seats and the Porsche can no longer be had with diesel power. At the time of this test, Jeep was also still selling its Grand Cherokee. Now that would save you around £5,000 over a GLE, but that's a five-seat only model, shortly due for deletion in its current form. And it's nothing like as efficient as this Mercedes, and it's cruder on tarmac too. It's the Range Rover Sport that you'd ideally want if you needed a large luxury premium SUV with up to seven seats that could be rewarding on a paved surface. But in recent times, that car has really rather priced itself out of contention. Think in terms of a seven seat Range Rover Sport costing around £8,000 more than a comparable GLE. Enough with the comparisons. Let's assume that you've decided that a GLE is exactly what you want and you now want to know just how generous Mercedes has been with the standard spec. So let's look in detail at that. All GLEs get the brand's 9G Tronic 9-speed automatic gearbox and some form of adaptive damping. And that's accessed through the Dynamic Select driving mode system, which, as usual on Mercedes models, also allows you to adjust the throttle response, the steering feedback, and the gear shift timings to suit the way that you want to drive. Uh, as we've said already, sporty AMG line trim is standard, which gets you AMG body styling for the front apron, uh, the rear apron, and the side skirts plus this diamond style single louver radiator grille which has been embellished with chrome pins. Uh, there's also LED high performance headlamps uh, with adaptive high beam assist, 20 inch five twin spoke design alloy wheels, heat insulating dark tinted privacy glass, roof rails, LED rear lamps, a powered easy pack tailgate and an alarm. Plus, there are auto-dimming, power-folding exterior mirrors which project a brand logo onto the ground as you enter or leave the car at night. Uh, there are all-round parking sensors and there are illuminated side running boards embellished with aluminium-look trim and rubber studs. 
Inside where the upholstery is trimmed with soft Nappa leather and the front seats are heated with lumbar support, an interior highlight is the 64 color ambient lighting system which bathes the cabin with soft soothing shades at night. Uh, you also get Thermotronic climate control, uh, multifunction leather stitch sports steering wheel, cruise control with a speed limiter, and a reversing camera. Uh, decor touches include anthracite open pore oak wood trim, a dash top that's stitched with Artico man made leather, AMG floor mats, and brushed stainless steel sports pedals. The real cabin talking point though is the MBUX, the Mercedes-Benz User Experience Multimedia Infotainment System, which is controlled by two 12.3 inch screens, one for the instrument cluster and another in the center of the dash. Uh, the MBUX system doesn't give you smartphone mirroring as standard, but what it does do is include hard disk navigation, a DAB radio, Bluetooth, uh, voice activation, and a live traffic information feature that's free for the first three years of ownership. Plus, there is also the brand's Hey Mercedes voice activation system, which you'll quickly find yourself using to operate many of the interior features. Uh, the MBUX package also incorporates another feature that we really like. It's what Mercedes calls Carter X communication. Now, this is a mobile phone supported exchange of information system, which will see your GLE sending data on driving conditions back to a central hub, which then shares it with other Mercedes drivers. That means that in a way that's uh, almost magical, your GLE will know in advance about things like icy conditions and traffic jams. It's very clever. Talking of information technology, like most premium brands, Mercedes has developed systems that allow you to monitor many aspects of your vehicle from your smartphone. Every GLE model comes as standard with the Mercedes Me Connect vehicle monitoring package. Now that works via a free app. Now this reminds you when a service is due and it can also automatically detect and share with you details on your car's uh, wear and tear items. In addition, the app uh, gives you a one touch button for for fast accident and breakdown recovery, and it will automatically alert the rescue services in the event of an accident. Uh, it can even track your GLE if it's stolen, tell you if it's left a pre-agreed uh, geographical boundary, if you lend it out, and it can tell you where the vehicle is if you've gone and forgotten where you parked it. Obviously, if you were to stretch to the top uh, Mercedes-AMG GLE 53 Formatic Plus variant, you'd want a bit more, which is why on that quick six-cylinder version, as with the top V8 63 Formatic Plus model, you get unique AMG trimming for the exterior, including bespoke wheel and radiator grill designs, plus AMG-specific menus and graphics for the interior screens. Uh, there's an AMG performance steering wheel with red top stitching and aluminium shift paddles and you get a bespoke AMG Dynamic Select driving mode system too with extra Sport Plus, Slippery, Trail and Sand settings. Now these match up to various provided basic, advanced and pro level AMG Dynamics drive programs which allow you to make the most of the various AMG engineered features. The AMG Ride Control Plus air suspension including active roll stabilization, uh, the sharper AMG specific steering rack and the enhanced high performance braking system. On to options. Now, earlier we mentioned that a buyer of this base GLE 300D Formatic model would need to pay extra for the third seating row, which is standard elsewhere in the range. If you are such a buyer and you choose to tick the box for what's called the seven seat equipment line package, then your car will also come with power adjustment for the second row seats, uh, power operated easy entry function to aid access to the added chairs at the very rear of the car, additional USB ports and four zones thermotronic climate control with an extra zone in the second row. All of those features are standard elsewhere in the range if you avoid a four cylinder model. Otherwise, in terms of extra cost kit, the main thing that your dealer will be directing you to is one of the optional premium packs, which bundle together most of the extra cost features that GLE buyers tend to want. The main inclusion in the standard premium equipment line pack is an ultra range multi-beam LED upgrade for the headlamps, uh, which allows them to deliver a forward beam of over 650 meters. Now that is the maximum light intensity permitted by law. Plus there is a 
Tesla 360 degree surround view camera system, a wireless charging mat, uh, also a memory package for the seats, the steering column and the exterior mirrors. And there's an active parking assist setup which will automatically steer you into spaces. Here we've got the embellished Premium Plus equipment line pack, which as well as all the extra premium features just mentioned, includes a powerful Burmester surround sound audio system upgrade, a huge panoramic glass roof, keyless go comfort keyless entry package, and the air balance feature that subtly scents the cabin with a pre-selected fragrance. On mainstream models, there are five choices. Uh, we've got downtown mood here. Uh, the Premium Plus equipment line pack also includes the energizing package. Now that uh, combines music, lighting and scent into a couple of selectable programs, uh, either Refresh and Vitality. Uh, these are aimed at rejuvenating you at the end of a tiresome day. There's also a training option which is aimed at relieving muscle strain on longer trips. And there's also an intelligent energizing coach feature. Uh, now this uh, recommends individual programs which are based on the kind of journey that you're on. Uh, now it can even communicate with a smartwatch or a fitness tracker if you happen to be wearing one and then it can automatically select a perfectly suited energizing theme that you can start directly just when you need it. What else? Uh, well, you'll almost certainly want the optional tech pack because unfortunately you have to have that to get Apple CarPlay or Android Auto smartphone mirroring. Now with this pack, you also get something that Mercedes calls augmented reality navigation. Now this is effectively a live camera feed of the road ahead that's overlaid with house numbers, road names, direction arrows, and other bits of useful information that'll help you to find your way. If you want to go further, you could opt for the Tech Plus package. Now that gives you the improved Mercedes head-up display. This is one of the best systems of this kind that we've tried. And perhaps less usefully, the so-called MBUX Interior Assistant, which allows various comfort and MBUX infotainment functions to be carried out by using specific hand gestures. Uh, we should talk about the optional off-road package too, although a vanishingly small number of GLE buyers are likely to want that. Uh, this pack, which is only available on this four-cylinder GLE 300D variant, includes a feature normally quite unknown in luxury SUV circles for any product without a Land Rover badge, a low-range gearbox. Plus, it also gives you hill descent control. Mercedes calls this downhill speed regulation. Uh, specific mud plugging settings for the ABS, stability and traction control systems. And for really difficult terrain, an extra selectable off-road plus setting in the dynamic select driving mode system. There's also extra torque on demand technology, both for the traction and dynamic control systems and for the clutch, which offers inter-axle locking, able to alter distribution of drive torque from naught to 100% between the axles. Uh, more relevant for a typical GLE owner would be the optional towing package. And that's only available on the six cylinder models, which increases the standard 2,700 kilo brake towing capacity figure to 3,500 kilos. And as well as throwing in an electronically folding tow bar, includes the brand's clever trailer maneuvering assist technology. Now at up to three miles an hour, this can control your steering angle while you're reversing backwards when hitched up as you monitor progress via dynamic guidelines lines shown as an additional part of the rear view camera display. Onto aesthetics. Now, unless you want your GLE painted in solid polar white, or as in this case, solid black, you're going to have to pay your dealer more for one of the various metallic colors. There are also a couple of even pricier Designio special shades, diamond white and hyacinth red. On the mainstream six cylinder models, you might also want to upgrade the wheels to larger 22 inch rims. Practical options include a stowage tub or a stowage crate for the boot, a concertina ring load sill protector, roof carrier bars, a roof box and a roof bicycle rack. For the cabin, you can add in various extras onto the front seat backs, folding tables, coat hangers and a mount for a tablet PC. 
Enough with that, let's switch to safety, which down the years has always been a primary consideration for Mercedes with this car. Let's give you some highlights from the roster this time around. Now let's start with active braking assist, which warns the driver of an impending collision and brakes automatically if there's no response. Testing has indicated that this whole setup will eradicate 20% of nose to tail accidents and will decrease their severity in a further 25% of cases. Lane keeping assist, is also standard and that's there to warn you if you drift out of your lane before applying subtle steering assistance to ease your GLE back to where it ought to be. And there's more. All variants get attention assist, which will monitor your driving reactions for drowsiness. And the pre-safe anticipatory safety program will tighten the seat belts, close the windows, and even adjust the seats in a fraction of a second if the stability system deems an accident to be inevitable. Uh, there's also an active bonnet to protect pedestrians and the usual twin front, side, and curtain airbags, plus a knee bag for the driver. As you'd expect, tyre pressure monitoring and and all the usual electronic aids for traction, uh, braking and stability control are included too. And traffic sign assist, speed sign recognition is built into the widescreen cockpit displays too. Adaptive brake lights flash in emergency stops to warn following motorists and an emergency call system alerts the rescue services with your exact GPS location if the airbags go off in an accident. If you want extra safety stuff, then you'll need to pay Mercedes about £1,700 more for the optional driving assistance package, which includes some of the brand's latest semi-autonomous driving technology. Now, to experience this, you have to be on a dual carriageway and you have to have activated two of the driving assistance package elements, uh, Active Distance Assist Distronic and Active Steering Assist. Now, the Distronic feature, that is basically a super advanced adaptive cruise control, which automatically regulates your distance to the car in front and which can, if necessary, remotely slow the car with up to 50% of stopping power. Active steering assist keeps you in the center of your designated lane and it will, if needed, apply subtle steering correction to ease you back to where you should be. If you're trying the autonomous driving capability, you'll also want to experience another neat feature that's part of this optional pack, uh, the clever Active Lane Change Assist system. On a dual carriageway with the Active Distance Assist Distronic Cruise Control and the Active Steering Assist operating, the car will overtake by itself. Yes, really, uh, you just hold the indicator stalk for a couple of seconds and it will pull out to pass the slower vehicle and then slot itself back into lane as soon as it's safe to do so. Another included driving assistance package element is the evasive steering assist feature, which scans the road ahead for pedestrians and which supports you in making sudden steering maneuvers to avoid them. Uh, pedestrians are also targeted by an upgraded active braking assist system, which is additionally embellished to be able to look out for unexpected tailbacks and crossing traffic. There's more in the driving assistance package too. Active blind spot assist not only warns you if you're about to dangerously pull out in front of another vehicle, but it applies light steering torque to correct the maneuver. And route-based speed adaptation uses navigation data to automatically adapt your speed before curves, roundabouts, junctions and toll roads. Now the pack also includes a pre-safe plus feature which helps specifically with vehicles running into the back of you, if necessary locking the brakes on standstill to prevent the car from being pushed into danger. Uh, there's also active speed limit assist which ensures that detective speed limits are automatically adopted as a set speed for that active distance assist distronic cruise control system that we mentioned earlier. Now we also like the exit warning function. Now this alerts passengers about to leave the vehicle to oncoming traffic or pedestrians. And finally, there's the reassurance of active emergency stop assist, which cuts in automatically should you be suddenly taken ill at the wheel, for instance, with a heart attack or a seizure. Now in such a nightmare scenario, this feature will allow the car to seamlessly take over, initiating emergency braking and activating the hazard flashes.
One of the last bastions of diesel power in the modern automotive market is that for large SUVs. And sure enough, as with its predecessor, almost all sales of this GLE will be of versions that sit from the black pump. Hence the introduction of fresh generation of diesel units this time around. The base GLE 300D formatic variant we're trying here with 245 horsepower uses the four cylinder two litre OM654 series unit from the E-Class and it manages up to a 46.3 mpg on the WLTP combined cycle and up to 162 grams per kilometer of NEDC rated CO2. Most GLE buyers though are going to want a six cylinder diesel if only to guarantee themselves uh, the standard fitment of airmatic suspension and seven seats in this car. Probably the uh, 272 HP 350D but possibly the 330 horsepower GLE 400D. Both these formatic models manage around 36 miles per gallon on the combined cycle and a CO2 reading on 20 inch wheels of up to 187 grams per kilometer. To give you some class perspective, a directly comparable six cylinder diesel BMW X5 xDrive 30D 265 HP model manages a fuel figure of 36.7 mpg that's quite similar, but a CO2 return that's considerably better, 165 grams per kilometer. Mercedes could have run BMW a little closer here if they'd introduced the kind of mild hybrid engine tech that Audi now uses in its rival Q7. Uh, for some reason though, that is limited to the six cylinder petrol powered GLE models that hardly anyone will buy, which is a pity because the inline petrol three litre six cylinder power plant that the brand offers in the GLE 450 formatic and the Mercedes AMG GLE 53 formatic plus variants is one of the most innovative engines in the lineup, featuring a 48 volt electrical system supplementing the usual 12 volt setup. Plus, instead of a conventional alternator, this EQ Boost power plant has an integrated starter generator that provides power for energy sapping items like the water pump and the air conditioning compressor. Plus, it also regulates engine idling and it's integral to the brake energy regeneration system. All of this enables a GLE 450 to return up to 32.5 mpg on the WLTP combined cycle, which should mean you'll get an operating range of around 600 miles from the 85 litre fuel tank. And there's up to 191 grams per kilometer of any DC rated CO2. All these you might think are pretty good figures for a big petrol powered SUV capable of sprinting to 62 in under six seconds. But still, we do have to point out they're fractionally behind what you get from BMW's similarly performing and conventionally engined X5 xDrive 40i, probably because of this Merck's extra 85 kilos of curb weight. The Mercedes AMG GLE 53 Formatic Plus variant, that manages around 30 mpg and and 212 grams per kilometer of CO2. If as a petrol or a diesel GLE buyer you want to do better, then you'll need the plug-in variant, and that's badge the GLE 350DE formatic. Uh, the PHEV version of the brand's smaller GLC SUV is based around a petrol engine, as is the case with most plug-in rivals, but Mercedes has chosen to use this 300D model's two-liter four-cylinder diesel here in a 194 horsepower state of tune. The electrified element of the powertrain is provided by a 100 kilowatt electric motor activated by a lithium ion battery which is one of the biggest that we've ever seen in a plug-in model 31.2 kilowatt hours in capacity now this promises a WLTP rated all-electric driving range of 61.5 miles and that facilitates an overall CO2 figure of 29 grams per kilometer this would be our variant of choice in the range provided you don't mind the fact that you'll need a fast charger for really quick plug-in turnaround times with a GLE 350DE. Uh, Mercedes talks of a 50 kilowatt DC public fast charger, of which there are over a thousand around the UK, which delivers a zero to 80% rapid charge in about 30 minutes. From a wall box, uh, this car will take uh, 90 minutes for a full charge, while from a conventional power socket, it'll require around about five hours. 
whichever GLE you choose, you'll get all the industry's most significant current efficiency aids, of course. So every version of this Mercedes gets an eco start stop function to cut the engine when you don't need it, when, for example, you're stuck in traffic or you're waiting at the lights. And a system that will disconnect the engine from the transmission at cruising speeds. Plus, the diesels also use an add blue system to cleanse the fuel of impurities uh, using additive from a reservoir which will need to be topped up at regular services. Mercedes has also done its best to boost efficiency with sleek aerodynamics, hence the class leading 0.29 CD drag coefficient figure down from 0.32 CD before. Uh, that's courtesy of a more wind cheating design for their door mirrors, uh, the rear lights and the wheels, plus sleeker underbody panelling. In addition, of course, the driver will have to play his or her part. Obviously, to get anywhere near the returns that we've just quoted, you'll need to select the Dynamic Select Driving Mode system into its Eco setting. Now, that marginally limits the accelerator pedal curve, and it also slightly restricts the output of the seat heating, uh, the heated rear window, and the air conditioning. You can also bring up two options on the two fascia monitors, which will help a consumption option in the vehicle section of the center dash screen shows graphically uh, your recent attempts at frugality and the selectable eco display in the instrument binnacle here grades your driving based on acceleration on decelerating and on constancy of speed showing in real time the bonus frugality that you've achieved through careful driving since the start of your journey what else? Well, as with all large luxury SUVs, VED tax will take quite a chunk out of your budget. The basic annual VED figure for diesels is £830, and for petrols, it's up at £1,240. All GLE models will then cost £450 a year in VED for the next five years before dropping to the standard £140 annual rate. On top of that, because all GLE models are priced well above £40,000, owners will need to pay a luxury car tax VED supplement that will set them back an extra £310 in the first year of ownership and that annual charge then rises to £450 until the fifth year of ownership. If you're wondering about benefiting kind taxation, well, we'll tell you that this 300D model sits in the 36% bracket while the 350D, the 400D and the 450 variants are rated at 37%. Other things we need to tell you include the comprehensive three-year unlimited mileage warranty. That's the same as BMW, but it betters Audi's three-year 60,000-mile package. Now, this is built on by Mercedes Mobilo scheme, which delivers breakdown cover for up to 30 years, as long as you continue to have your car serviced at a Mercedes main dealer. And it's also worth pointing out uh, that your uh, maintenance outlay can be kept a little in check by going for the optional service care package, which takes care of routine maintenance and it spreads the cost of regular servicing and guarantees the price of parts and labour for up to four services. And it covers the cost of all the recommended service items such as brake fluid, spark plugs, air filters, fuel filters and screen wash. There's also an assist dashboard service indicator that monitors engine use and tells you exactly when a garage visit's due. Uh, for reference, servicing is usually required every 15,500 miles or every year, whichever comes first. Fixed price servicing is available uh, across the range and most buyers opt for the Mercedes service care plan that could cost you as little as about £33 a month based either on a two service, two year deal, three years with three services or four years with four services. Uh, it's also worth mentioning that the optional Mercedes Me Connect services package includes uh, a remote self-diagnostic capability and that enables your GLE to monitor wear and tear items and to alert your local dealer to let you know if something needs seeing to. You can also insure your car through Mercedes, although most company drivers will, of course, have that included in their lease cost. If you do pay the insurance in your car yourself, uh, you'll need to know about the ratings, which are a little on the high side. Even the entry-level GLE 300D diesel is up at Group 44 or Group 45 for this highly specced version, while the GLE 350D is Group 45 or 46, and the GLE 400D is Group 48. The petrol GLE 450 sits in groups of 47 or 48. 
Predictably, residual values aren't anything like as high as those you get for the brand's larger classic G-Class SUV. Independent owners reckon that an owner of a highly specced GLE 300D could expect to see 45.1% of the original purchase price back after a typical three-year, 60,000-mile ownership period. Still, that is a showing that's uh, comparable or better than can be managed by obvious direct rivals. So, how to sum up this GLE? Firstly, here's what it won't do. Stride across the Gobi Desert quite like any Land Rover product, or power around Brands Hatch quite like a more sporting BMW X5. But for us, that's not a problem. This car, after all, intentionally sets out to offer more of a middle ground between those two extremes. And it's a place in which this GLE seems far more comfortable than was the case with its predecessors. There are lots of reasons why. Four-cylinder model bars are offered a plug-in variant with by far the longest battery-powered range in the PHEV segment. And six-cylinder customers get supple aromatic air suspension, which complements this car's class-leading refinement. Whatever your choice of engine, you get the classiest cabin in the sector. And thanks to the MBUX media setup, arguably the most advanced infotainment system too. Plus, the cabin is now just about big enough to properly accommodate the seven-seat format, which has considerably widened this GLE's potential customer reach. Yet for all that, we've come away a little frustrated here, aware, perhaps in a way that most likely buyers won't be, that this V167 series model's design has a technological CV that could have made it significantly better. In other markets, this car can rock itself out of ruts. It enables the air suspension at each corner of the car to adjust itself independently, and it can scan the road ahead for bumps, predictively adapting ride quality to suit. At the time of this test, Mercedes was telling us that none of this technology was going to be offered here. Would it all make a difference? Well, to people like us who want this car to be as good as it can be, yes. A typical GLE customer, though, probably wouldn't specify this kind of stuff anyway, so perhaps Mercedes does know best after all. Ultimately, the Stuttgart brand builds more SUVs than anyone else, and there's a reason why, globally, this is the most popular model of that kind that the company makes. It's true that there are sportier, more dynamic models of this sort that you could buy, but we're struggling to think of many that offer a better all-round package. Capable, practical, and luxurious, this is the best mainstream large SUV that we've yet seen from the three-pointer star by far. Mercedes is now at last fully credible in this segment.